Okay, everybody. It is a little after nine, and uh, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and get started. We are streaming live. Uh, we are also doing video capture for this session. Uh, we will post the video hopefully early next week so that anyone who didn't have the chance to come and who for some reason wants to watch this 30-minute uh, session can do so. So I want to thank you, you four for coming. We really appreciate uh, your interest. Uh, this is our first attempt to do regional sessions for the support fund to talk to people, uh, to travel around the state and talk to people about what opportunities are out there through the support fund, uh, what restrictions there are in the support fund, and then to provide an opportunity for faculty from any campus uh, to ask their individual questions about, about projects. We do have a fairly full schedule today, uh, particularly with R&D and enhancement. Uh, so a lot of investigators have signed up to come. Uh, I'd like to introduce first our staff. Uh, Brian Jones is to my left. He is the enhancement program manager, and he'll be speaking to you about the enhancement program in a minute. Uh, Zenobia Simmons is at the back. She is our R&D our program manager, and she will uh, introduce you to those sub-programs. And Christine Norton, to my right, is our admin manager, and she will give you just a brief overview of what our post-award landscape looks like at the Board of Regents. So um, I'd like to just start with the origins of the support fund because it's, it's actually important to understanding what our programs are and why they operate the way we do the, the way they do the board of regents support fund is a constitutionally dedicated fund that means it is it is placed in the constitution of the state uh, it runs from the interest earnings on the louisiana education quality trust fund which is uh, a currently 1.4 billion dollar trust fund that's housed at treasury treasury invests the fund uh, and we run off the interest earnings and royalty earnings on the fund. That fund was established through a large oil and gas settlement in the 1980s. It was established in 1986, so we are more than 30 years old at this point, which is kind of impressive. Um, we are limited by the Constitution to two big goals and four areas in which we can expend funds. The two big goals that we are charged to accomplish for Louisiana is, are the enhancement of the quality of post-secondary education and contribution to the development and diversification of Louisiana's economy. So those two things overarch everything that we do. Everything we do has, has to be in service of those two goals. That's why you'll see in all of our programs that request that you, that any applicant justify a project in terms of an economic development impact, that's because the Constitution charges us to expend money for that purpose. In terms of the four programmatic areas in which we're permitted to expend money, there's uh, the endowment of chairs for eminent scholars, uh, recruitment of superior graduate students, the uh, enhancement of academic research and agricultural departments and units, and targeted research and development. Uh, in terms of um, enhancement, those three words, academic, research, and agricultural, are actually very important. The support fund is all on the academic side. Everything that we fund has to have uh, an academic uh, research workforce component. We don't do administration. We don't do general operations. We don't do recreation, general student support services or uh, athletics. No funds can be requested for those types of activities. Uh, our enhancement program, Brian will tell you about in a minute, but it is very broad. Our R&D program is somewhat more targeted and largely targeted in STEM, though we do have a very small arts, humanities, and social sciences component in R&D. Our support fund programs are very, very competitive. Almost everything that we do, with the exception of endowed professorships, is uh, competitively based. It requires a proposal submission, external review. Uh, all of our evaluators, we send everything out to out-of-state reviewers. We try to keep everything objective. We screen for conflicts of interest. So we don't do anything in state in terms of project evaluation. Uh, that's important as you complete proposals because it's important to remember the people who are going to be reading and judging the proposals are not from here. 
they need to know the context in which things are happening here. Um, it is a competitive process, but we do publish our scoring rubrics. All of the scoring rubrics we use are in the RFPs. So if you have questions about how things are weighted, about how things will be judged, look in the RFPs, you will find the scores there. Uh, the programs, are, we have a very low success rate currently. The support fund about 10 years ago was generating about $35 million that the Board of Regents alone could expend on competitive programs. Now uh, the trust fund generates about $20 million that we can expend on competitive programs. So if you've been around a while and you think that we're funding less than we used to, we are funding less than we used to because our revenue stream has fallen. Uh, hopefully that will pick up in the next few years, though it's impossible to tell and currently revenue estimating is holding us fairly level. So last year, our success rate program-wide across the entire support fund, our success rate was about 21%. That means about one in five proposals submitted were funded. We got a little over 400 proposals last year, about 425 proposals last year. We funded a little over 100. So that makes up that 21%. That success rate is a little bit misleading because the uh, endowments which require a private sector contribution before you can even come to us for the match that the, that the support fund can provide. The endowments have a somewhat higher success rate. The success rate in endowments was about 30%. So that means the success rate in the granting programs, which are the direct support for immediate expenditure, uh, was about 15. So that tells you that uh, all of the programs we offer are, are very, very competitive, that anyone uh, submitting a proposal should keep that in mind, that you need to put your very best foot forward in, in submitting that proposal because we can only fund about one in five. So what I'll do now is uh, I'll briefly tell you about the programs that I manage personally, and then I will ask Brian to come tell you about departmental enhancement, and then Zenovia will follow, and Christine. Uh, I manage all of the endowment programs. Uh, if you have any questions, any issues with either existing or proposed endowments, uh, please send them to me. I spend, I would say, at least 50% of my time on the endowment programs. We currently have about 3,500 endowments that have been matched by the support fund. This is not inclusive of any endowments that the campuses hold that are entirely private. Uh, so so it is, it's a big pool of money. We have given about $600 million in endowment matching to date, and the current market value of our endowments is over a billion dollars. The matched endowments is over a billion dollars. Uh, I also uh, manage the Awards to Louisiana Artists and Scholars Program, which is our research program for arts, humanities, and social sciences. And it funds uh, creative and scholarly projects in those disciplines faculty member doesn't have to be in those disciplines. The project has to be in those disciplines. Uh, and again, that, that program averages a success rate of about 12%. So it, it is very, very competitive. So with that, I will ask Brian to come and uh, describe departmental enhancement to you, and then Zenovia will follow with R&D. Good morning. I'm Brian Jones. I run the departmental enhancement program, like she said. Uh, and uh, what we do is exactly in the name. It's departmental enhancement. How can I make my department better? Uh, we reformatted the whole program. It's one of the original programs uh, but from back in 1987. It's gone through a lot of trade changes, but uh, it's always been the most accessible. It's always been the one that any kind of university can apply to, and, and every kind of university has had a degree of success that's pretty, uh, pretty fairly well even. It's fairly well even playing ground. Um, it, we, we reformatted the program and called it, and I decided to call it departmental enhancement, and that's for a reason. And when you're putting together a proposal, you need to keep that in mind, all right? It's uh, given the chance we wanted to, to really focus it on the, the constitutional mission that they, they wrote in there 30-something years ago, and that is to take your department. What can I do for my department to, to move it forward, to move it tangibly forward? A year later or five years later, and going into the future, into nine, ten years later, you're better off because we invested in you. Uh, I was talking to a grants guru person at a workshop a few weeks ago, and, and I mentioned that that's what we had done. He said that's what, what programs across the country are doing. They're saying, 
it's, it's less of more what can you do for us and more, uh, more uh, or what can we do for you, here's some money, go do what you can, you had a cool idea, see what you can do. And with grant money tightening up all across the country, programs are, are getting wise and saying, we want, this is an investment, this is money that's shrinking, uh, this is money we can't waste. And we're looking for the very, very best investment of our money. And for this program, that means pushing your department forward, pushing your academic unit forward, however, however they organize your program. What can you do that, that, that makes the, that program tangibly better? Uh, the way I, I wrote that in there is we came up with a mission statement, and we put that right at the very beginning so that you can put that in there. You can talk to your, your you have, you know, you've got a memo from your department, from the administrators, saying these are the top priorities we have for the next five to ten years. And your job for the next eight, ten pages is to make that argument, that this is a project that really attacks those priorities. Uh, there's two types of projects that approach that two different ways. Um, there's the targeted enhancement. This is a one-year program that you can request up to $200,000. And that's just like uh, the same old enhancement projects we've done for 30-something for years. It's, uh, here's an idea uh, to make, you know, my department tangibly better over the next year. You get one year to do it. Um, the new ones we brought in were a bigger, uh, more ambitious project that's going to be up to five years and up to a million dollars. Uh, we fund about one to three of these each year. Uh, that was the plan. We came in and we thought, we're looking at the available money, and if they funded one to three of these things, we could keep a pretty balanced approach and, and fund enough targeted enhancement projects to, to bring a good balance to the program, and it's kind of worked out that way. Uh, this, we went through two cycles. This is going to be our third go around, which means we're repeating the, the biannual uh, cycle of disciplines, and we didn't really change much at all. And it worked out pretty nice that we did fund three. Uh, we, we put it up to a, a final panel that we picked out of some uh, fancy administrative folks, and they, uh, they, they decided that their idea was, was about right. And they funded two million dollar grants and a 600,000 the first time around, and they did about the same thing the next time. Uh, I, was, I was wondering what kind, of, what kind of departments would be favored, and my guess would be a couple of the big time grant scoring machine departments and maybe a wild card, and that's kind of how it worked out. The first year, uh, uh, health and med and engineering got one, and then the humanities. So you're, you're talking about programs that, that get million dollar grants uh, year round, and they're competing for them year round, and uh, a couple of them got it, but uh, uh, another one, uh, uh, humanities came through. Uh, this year, and the last time it was, what was it, chemistry and engineering maybe? So it's a, I've been real impressed with, uh, with the new format, how it, it's the, the reviewers have funded all different types of programs and, and they've kept the regional balance even though the money's been smaller and the awards are, are less because we're funding a few big giant ones. But it's still a pretty even spread. Uh, so they had about 20, an average of 22 comprehensive proposals submitted both years. And there was 150 the first year targeted, a little bit less than that last year, probably 130 something targeted. But if you look at the numbers, it's pretty, to statistically, your chances, just superficially, are about the same, right? It's uh, 3 out of 23, you know, 20 out of 150. But you do have to really think about it hard, all right? Because like I said, engineering, chemistry, health and med, these are the people you're, the disciplines you're competing against, or you might even be, you know, within that discipline competing against programs and med schools that get five-year million-dollar grants. And, uh, they're good at those. And if you uh, are, are not that type of program, this would be the first time you ever got a million dollar grant, yours is gonna, is gonna look different. And your, pro, uh, your, your resources are gonna be different. The Tulane Brain Institute, when they came up with that name, they didn't come up, you know, get it from scratch. They had a bunch of neurosurgeons and a bunch of fancy equipment, and they brought them all together and connected them and said, if you get us X, Y, and Z, and help us bring in these fancy uh, scientists to join our team, we can do that for a million dollars. If you're starting from scratch on a cool center for your region, I talked to someone who wanted to come up with a stroke therapy center, and he had a, a good five-year plan, but he'd never written a grant before. I said, maybe, maybe you start smaller. Maybe you say, here's a pilot project that's a one-year plan, 
and I have this amazing five-year plan and this is step one and you're going to help me do step one or maybe you're going to help me do step one and step two as opposed to him coming with his 20-step plan and competing against these bigger projects that are run by multiple people with uh, bios that take up half the proposal. So it's just something to think about when you're choosing which type of grant you're going to, you're going to apply for. Uh, but, but I've been surprised that, that uh, it's, you're not really precluded based on the type of university you're in uh, or the, the region of the state you're in. Uh, what you need to think about is more along the lines of your experience and who you're competing with. Um, the one thing I'll, I'll mention, there's, there's a few things I'm going to mention at the end about, uh, you know, before we wrap up, about the best ways to compete. But there's a couple um, that are pretty specific to my program that I want to tell you about. Number one is we're going to tell you and reiterate again that you, you read the RFP, which is a duh kind of thing, but you'd be surprised the more successful you are, the more likely you are not to read the RFP because your brain tells you you already know what you're doing. Uh, but you respond to the RFP. That's just as important. Any grant program you ever apply for in the history of your academic career, you respond to what they're looking for. Because if you don't respond to what they're looking for, you just take your idea and put it over top of their, their, their wishes, you're going to get dismissed. That's the, the first ones that do get dismissed, no matter how well it's written. And the call of RFP is to take the mission of your department and target the top priority or to target a comprehensive list of priorities. So it's targeted, it's comprehensive. If your project's not doing that, no matter how well it's written, no matter how cool your idea sounds, it's going to get dismissed. Uh, because the, what I tell my reviewers when I hire them and when I give them their, their protocol, I say, you're looking for stuff that fits this RFP, that drives their departments forward, that really makes a strong argument for talk, tackling their top priorities. And if it's just you with a cool idea and a few people doing research with you because it's what you've been wanting to do for a few years and now you've got time to get this machine and work on it, they're going to read it exactly that way and they're going to dismiss it. Um, another word that uh, is, is key for, for most types of grants, but specifically for enhancement, is sustainability. This should be just tattooed on your brain when you're writing an enhancement grant. Sustainability. Because if you're investing in anything, you want it to be sustainable because if you take $200,000 and rent a year of time to give out scholarships or rent a year of time to do some professional development for eight faculty members and four of which aren't coming back, uh, if, you, if you take a year to rent a, a bunch of software, who's going to pay for it the next year? Sustainability. Everything you, have, you do should be putting down a sustainable uh, effect that is tangible uh, a few years later, whether it's tangibly physically, like a bunch of machinery, or tangibly like you rewrite the curriculum for a degree program that modernizes it and brings in students and recruits. That's tangible. If your objectives are to enhance recruiting by designing a new curriculum, and five years later you have a new curriculum and you're getting 50% you know, more students into your program, that's tangible. So sustainability. And the other thing I'll, I'll, I'll end with that uh, are two words you should, you should write down and just remember every time you write a sentence in your grant are need and impact. And those are the, the, the buzz, not buzzwords, but just a, a word that I've beaten into people's brains for years. And when I did sit down with this guy at a workshop and talk to him, the guy you know, getting paid to tell people how to write grants, that's what he said. He said, it's need. How bad do I need this? Because those are the two things you're competing against. Everyone else's need and everyone else's impact. Uh, and you might think that you have need, and you might think that it looks obvious, because I'm at a small university and our, our main biology research machine broke, and we're going to lose accreditation, and we can't teach certain graduate school classes. And uh, we're so needy, and therefore, if I write this grant for it, they, they'll see that and they'll give me money. But the problem is that there was 175 people that applied last time the cycle was up, and they all felt pretty needy too. Okay. Uh, so, it's how do you attack that need, and that need has to drive every single part of your argument, every time you say something. We need this. And not in a negative way, that's another thing this guy said, is to don't come off with a negative approach, and I, I said I tell people to, to attack it positively. You say, I've identified a problem, I've got the answer, and you're going to help me, all right? You don't say, woe is us, woe is us, if you don't give this money, we're going to lose accreditation, we're so pitiful. You say. 
I came into my department, I've got this, this, and this we're going to attack, we're going to do it this way, and if you give this, me this money, I'm going to prove it to you. You, you, you know, but it's still need. It's still need. It's still need-based. And the other thing is impact. Like I said, if you have a project that you've always wanted to do, and you and your two research buddies could get this machine and write a lot of papers. That sounds great, but what if that was part of a larger project that uh, you could teach, you know, umpteen grad students, a bunch of undergrad students, you're sharing it with two other departments, you're creating a shared lab, that's what you're competing against, and that impact is way much bigger than yours. So no matter how fancy your, 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 your grant sounds and how many people on your team have gotten uh, so many grants and written so many papers and you're so impressive, if your impact is very limited, you're going to be dismissed because the competition is higher than it's ever been. Uh, when, when Carrie mentions that, I always figure if I was like a salesman rep in the back of the room and I was in charge of her, I'd be like, you know, you're really not selling the, the, the program very well, telling us that we're giving away 40% less awards in the last 10 years. But what she's doing is telling you the truth, all right? And that shouldn't change your approach in terms of signing up for our program, making an application. It should just change uh, your, your mentality, okay? Because there was a point when I, a few years into me having this job 15 years ago, where we were giving away a lot of money, and it was easy money. And I was looking at stuff that was getting awarded, and I'm like, how did this, this is sloppy, you know? But they, the money was there, and the need, they can, if they can read through the lines and see your need, they're going to give you money because we're funding 40% of our proposals. There were smaller programs that had a cap, and so if 50 people applied or 10 people applied, we're still going out like $1.25 million. Sometimes we would fund 60, 70% of those proposals, which is insane. And I would tell people, you are stupid. You are literally, honestly stupid if you don't apply, if you're an established person that has time to write one of these. Because you can flip a coin, and if it lands on the right one, you, you got money. It's not like that now, but it's still a really unique program, okay? Every time I hire a reviewer, they, they look at our RFP and say, I wish I had this in Kentucky. You know, I wish I had this in Ohio. Uh, the numbers are now closer to federal programs in terms of the percent we give out, but you have a resource here that if you don't take advantage of it while you're looking at different federal programs, it's silly because people in different states don't have this. Uh, and it's still a great, great training ground. All right, it's still, if you, you know, I'm talking to a guy at ULM that's never written a grant before. He's super sharp, has a great idea, but you gotta, you gotta learn somewhere. And he's not learning in the old undergraduate enhancement program where ULM could write anything and have a pretty fair shot at getting it. <coughs> but you, you gotta start somewhere, and this is a pretty, pretty good place to start. Uh, that's all I have for enhancement for now, and I'll talk to you in a little bit. Okay, so Zenobia Simmons is going to come up and just give a brief overview of the R&D subprograms. And hopefully we'll have just a couple of minutes for general questions at the end of the session. Good morning. My name is Zenobia Simmons. I'm the program manager for the research competitiveness subprogram, the industrial ties research subprogram, and the proof of concept prototype initiative. RCS, the objective is to build and strengthen Louisiana's institution's research base to make the institutions more competitive. That being said, RCS seeks to fund those individuals who are at the threshold of becoming competitive. They've identified barriers that have stood in their way. They have a plan to overcome those barriers and within a two to three year time period, they should be competing at the national level. Eligible faculty are tenured and tenured track faculty. Keep in mind, priority will be given to the junior faculty uh, when compared to, say, an established researcher that is changing their research focus. Eligible disciplines are computer and information sciences, biological sciences, earth and environmental. Those disciplines are eligible every year. Agriculture, chemistry, engineering A or B, mathematics, physics and astronomy, health and medical, social sciences are on a two-year rotation. Funding, you may request up to $200,000 for a maximum of three years 
the RCS does have a one-year component where you can request up to $20,000. Last year, we had 153 proposals submitted. 28 were funded. So that gives you an idea as to how competitive the RCS really is. The awards range from 45000 to 65000 um, The RCS is also a multi-stage review uh, process, uh, subject areas, review the proposals submitted in that discipline. The final panel has the responsibility of providing uh, recommendations to the board for all disciplines, those proposals that should be funded from all disciplines. Notices of intent are due September the 11th. Your proposal is due November the 7th. ITRS. The objective is to develop and diversify Louisiana's economy. Proposals submitted must show significant involvement from the private sector. Eligible faculty are tenure, tenure track, and research faculty. The proposal submitted must involve research, not just data collection or testing for the industry partner. They can pay for that themselves. Targeted areas identified by the Board of Regents in economic development are life sciences and bioengineering, digital media and enterprise software, coastal and water management, advanced materials and manufacturing, clean energy and technology. The ITRS is also uh, a program with a multi-stage review process. Uh, proposals are reviewed in that targeted area and then by the final panel that again make recommendations to the board. You, re you may request up to $350,000 for up to three years. Last year, we had 41 proposals submitted, six were funded, and the award ranged from $64,000 to $80,000. Proposals are due October the 31st. POCP, Proof of Concept Prototype Initiative. The objective is to fund proposals to do just that, to prove a concept and or to develop a prototype. The work must have commercialization and technology transfer potential. The work must be uh, fully disclosed and managed by your institution's technology transfer office. Eligible faculty are tenured, tenure track, and full-time research faculty. Full research faculty. Eligible disciplines, targeted areas is the same as the ITRS. You may request up to $40,000 for one year of support, but no less than $10,000. Last year, 28 proposals were submitted, seven were funded. Funding ranged about the $40,000 max. Letters of support from your PIs from your uh, department chair, from your dean or director, uh, must show commitment for the individual to complete this work. Letters of support from the user or developer or an investor in a prototype are encouraged. Uh, proposals are due October 31st. And with that being said, I'll turn it back to Carrie. Okay, I'd like to ask Christine Norton to come up and just say a couple of words about our post-award process. Uh, it's important to note that these four people in the room, this is the support fund staff. This is all of us. So if you need anything related to the support fund, you can ask one of us. We all work next door to each other. We all, we've all been stuck in a van together for several days. Uh, so, so anything you ask of any of us, we can refer you to the right individual among the four of us. Hi, I'm Christine Norton. I'm the Grants and Contracts Manager. Um, I handle most post-award stuff. Uh, anything you submit will be through our online network called Logan. 
And um, from proposal submission to the end of funded contracts, I maintain, um, once the contracts are funded, I maintain all of the reports, payments. I process all the payments. I send notices of everything that's due, um, reminders. Um, so anything on that end, I mostly deal with your sponsor programs offices and accountants uh, for invoices and stuff like that. But um, anything with Logan, um, I can, I, I'm the one who sets it all up. So once you do get funded, I'll be the one who goes in and makes sure everything's set up correctly. And if you ever have any questions, you can always contact our support or me. Um, so that's about it. <laughs> Okay, well, we're almost out of time. I just want to run through uh, very briefly some advice for applicants. This, this is the secret part. This is the part that uh, will tell you exactly how you're supposed to win. Um, first, as Brian said before, read the RFP in its entirety. Make sure you know what the RFP is asking for. Make sure that you know what our goals are because the less you align with, our, with the goals of our programs, the less likely you are to be funded. Uh, make sure that your, all the projects are fully responsive to our goal, to the program's goals, objectives, priorities, and guidelines. Uh, Brian always likes to say, if you don't follow our guidelines for proposal development, if you don't have everything in the right order and where it's supposed to be and respond to all the things that you're required to respond to, you're going to annoy some reviewers. You're also going to miss some information that you really needed to have in that proposal even if that information is does not apply, uh, the, the reviewers are going to have questions if you leave things out and the, re the reviewers are going to get annoyed if they can't follow the proposal the way that it's set up. Uh, ask questions of program managers. There, there seems to be a rumor going around that we're all unapproachable and unless we come out in an event like this, you can't call us. That is absolutely not true. If you look at the handout and if anyone is watching this on video, the handout is available on the regional meetings webpage on our website. If you look at the handout, the front gives you a brief description of all of our programs, but on the back is the deadlines for each program, the required elements for each program, and the email addresses of the, the right people to contact with questions about this program. So please make use of that. We are in our offices almost all the time. We like to talk to applicants. Uh, we appreciate talking to applicants and we'd rather talk to you before uh, you make a mistake than try to clean it up afterwards. So please call us. We are always available. Uh, until October 15th, our Q&A deadline for the current uh, round of submissions is October 15th. Uh, and finally, don't make obvious mistakes. This sounds self-evident, but it is something that's very common in our world that, that as Zenovia likes to say, you leave the easy points on the table. And you, the way that you do that is to do things like you don't leave enough time to read critically. You're right up against the deadline to get that thing in, and you didn't look through it, and something was wrong. For example, last year I had uh, a proposal in Atlas that requested $5 million. The, uh, <laughs> the, the maximum you can request in Atlas is $50,000. If you dive into the proposal and you look at the budget page, it is $50,000, but it requested $5 million. So try to avoid errors like that. Uh, understand how the scores operate. We put the scores in there for a reason so that you can see how we're weighting things, what kind of emphases are in the, prog in the programs. Uh, if you have time, get an objective external reader to look at your project and make sure that it makes sense to someone who's not you. Proofread. Again, sounds obvious, but a lot of people don't do it. Proofread the project. Uh, our reviewers tend to say that obvious errors in a project, lack of proofreading, shows a lack of care in its preparation, and that raises a question about the risk of funding the project. If a lack of care went into the preparation of the proposal, what does that say about the implementation of the idea? No one adhere to budget requirements. Uh, justify every item. Be judicious in what you're requesting. Make sure that the panels, when they look at your budget, they know why you need every item that you're requesting. Uh, know the campus requirements and deadlines. Many campuses have their own internal deadlines because the proposals come from the campus to us, not from individual investigators to us. So if you miss a campus deadline, there's nothing we can do. And finally, don't miss our deadlines because there's nothing we can do in those cases either. Our system shuts down 
at the deadline date and time. We are not, our, our RFPs have what they call the force of law, which means we cannot make exceptions or changes to the RFP, not on an individual basis and not on a group basis unless we have a justification for doing so. The two times that we have done that in my 20 year history at the support fund was Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. We pushed deadlines back and the 2016 floods because the deadlines and the events were so close together and so many people were disrupted by those events that we did a statewide extension of our deadlines. Uh, the last thing I would say, and then uh, if you have general questions, you can come talk to me after, uh, and I'll let Brian and Zenobia get on with their appointments, is uh, manage expectations. As Brian said, we don't tell you about our, our funding uh, vagaries to just discourage you from applying. We tell you about them so that you can be realistic about what you're trying to do and you can be as competitive as you possibly can be. Uh, it is true that we give away a lot less money, but still, in new awards last year, we gave away $10 million. That's not nothing. Uh, it's a substantial amount of money. We're the, about the only source in the state of discretionary money to support academic initiatives on a supplementary and enhancing basis extra things that you want to do, things that will launch you forward that you can't do with existing operating resources. That's what we're here for. So put your best foot forward, compete uh, as strongly as you can, and we'll hope to see you at the end of the cycle. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. If you have an appointment with uh, R&D, that's Zenovia. If you have an appointment with Enhancement, that's Brian, and they'll be at separate tables in the room. Thank you so much.